Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Techno Social. Today, my guest is the one and only Daniel Frager, where we'll be, we will be talking about the book Ontological Design. What comes next? What's the book about? Why was it written? And so on and so forth. So, Daniel, welcome. We've got our jackets on because we're trying to be professional today. Tell me, what is Ontological Design? It is indeed a special day today. Ontological design, it's something that we've been discussing many, many times on this podcast. And it's a really tricky subject because it's not only about design, but about many, many other things, about philosophy, about psychology, it's about religion, it's about psychoanalysis, it's about occultism. But in the end of the day, you could pick it apart from many angles. But for me personally, it is the design discipline that allows us to design human subjectivity allows us to design identity, our ideologies, and ultimately plays with us, with belief as a subject matter. To put it in like one sentence very simply, it's what happens when design crosses over into brainwashing because we have the power of AI close to us and because we are constantly plugged into the digital. We're always looking at media and the way that this media is framing us is essentially what I'm trying to design with ontological design. Because the, the, the famous saying goes, as we design our world, our world designs us in return. The more we use our apps, our phones, our lamps, our forks, our blazers, the more we use them, the more we are designed by them in this reciprocal fashion. So that's the core, the core, core, core of ontological design. It's the idea that today and not 10 years ago, not 50 years ago, and only today, uh, this design discipline becomes possible when we, because we have AI, because we have this knowledge, because we've reached this sort of critical point in history, we can address this new type of project that takes reality and says, why don't I design it by designing perception itself? Design reality by designing perception and mm. vice versa. Okay, so allow me to play devil's advocate with you on a couple of points here just to tease out so the first one is so you're saying we're going to design perception and design um subjectivity can we do this aren't there certain parameters to subjectivity to perception that are kind of fixed and immutable like how much power do we really have over the human in many ways ontological design may come across and sometimes this communication may come across as we're designing the human, but uh, to be more precise and technical about it, you're actually framing the human. The human itself, maybe it's undesignable. Maybe our passions are unconscious, our drives, our blood. You can't really design that in a factory or in a lab. But what you can do is frame it, is design everything around it, and thereby you design subjectivity. It's a very tricky thing, right? You're not going to invent life uh, technically, invent a perception technically, but you can certainly frame it and, and canalize it. I like one of the things that I've heard you say, you kind of take um, Zizek's riff about film or cinema as the ultimate pervert's art because it teaches you not what to desire, but how to desire. And you've kind of thought that you can apply that to ontological design as well. Like, how does that work? Yeah, so... When you see, a, that's an interesting one, right? When you see a movie, you want to be like the main character or you want to hate the main character if the movie so allows. Uh, but in many ways, what happens is you are told how to desire. You were told the method of desiring itself. So it's not so much that it tells you be like character A or B, which is, which is one level of it. But there's also this other level, which is you shall desire by mimicking characters in movies. This is sort of the process. So it's the how-to. And you can frame the how-to. Same with ontological design. It's not designing people so much to, okay, you're going to be this, this, or that, which you can certainly do to an extent. Um, but it's desiring, it's designing how the people desire those characters themselves. So there's there's a level here, a degree of separation here that is that is exactly where desire operates and where you can canalize it uh, in, in a sort of indirect fashion. So it's about like kind of crafting environments so as to allow particular ways of desiring to be expressed and to prohibit certain other ways of desiring. Exactly. It's creating constellations of apparatuses around an individual, around the subject, or many subjects, in fact, that prescribe a way of desiring certain moral codes, 
that prescribe certain memes and apparatuses that ultimately all stack up like Legos to build a view of reality, a reality tunnel. Those are the bricks with which we construe our worlds, right? These symbols that are, uh, you, these are, they are more our houses than our real houses are because we live in and through these symbols. We desire through these symbols. Our very being is expressed by no other uh, means other than these symbols, these apparatuses, these habits. Uh, and indeed, yeah, we're trying to design those habits of desiring. I think like what you've just touched on there is what I, in the book, you're calling the mimetic stack. Yeah. Can you give a like brief outline of what that stack looks like and how the different layers work? Yeah, for sure. Four or five layers, right? There's the meme, the very basic concept, the idea, the pure idea, the basic idea, atomic idea. Then you have the apparatus, a bunch of memes together. Maybe it begins to look a little bit like a thing that you do, right? Uh, an object, a pen, a cigarette, the internet, words. Um, above that, you have the reality tunnel. Then you have the meme plex, and then you have the newosphere. And I'll explain in a little bit what they all mean. But the reason why there needs to be a mimetic stack is because ontological design as a discipline occurs across all scales. So when you're an architect, you can create drawings at every scale as well. You can design doorknobs and you can look at the window and the way that it closes, but you could also look at the urban setting of your house, of your building, how it fits with the mountains, with the roads, with the rivers at the macro scale. So too in ontological design, right? The structures of subjectivity that we are creating in order to, to frame the subject and to create their identity can also happen at these very, very, uh, uh, at all levels. So you can create a little grammar of words that are cool to use in a specific place. Great ontological design. You could also uh, create the specific apparatuses that are going to be used by an individual time and again. An app, a phone, um, a guitar. Those are apparatuses. The thing is when you start to create a constellation of apparatuses, and if you do that deliberately with the project, which is a fundamental word here, then you begin to aim at something very different. Above the scale of the apparatus, which you could say it, they are all around me, right? I have many of them at hand. You go into the scale of the reality tunnel, which is the sum total of all possible apparatuses that we are in touch with. Everything that I can see is part of my reality tunnel. So the total, this is a big word, the holistic, total, totalitarian constellation of apparatuses constitutes my reality tunnel. Um, they are the bricks of my reality tunnel. Uh, they are the lens through which I interface with quote unquote reality. To be more precise, they are reality itself. And so this is what we often talk about in, 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 as the individual. The thing is, when you have a lot of these reality tunnels, what you notice is that they there are they are all networked between people socially, right? Right now we are using Zoom, we're talking to each other and there is a lens from within my reality tunnel towards you. Zoom as the apparatus allows the other to enter my reality tunnel. And you can, you know, our houses have plumbing to flush away all our debris. So too do our reality tunnels have sort of a way to flush the brain, to bring in social nourishment, social relations, etc. And when you have this, these networks come together, you have a memeplex, which is the next bit of the scale. And the memeplex speaks to cultural codes, discourses, what gets to be said or not, the morals of a specific group. In certain countries, you can buy women with camels. In certain countries, you cannot. These are differences of the order of the memeplex to which you belong. Uh, uh, and the, of the order of social values. And then ultimately, when you have a lot of meme plexes together, then you, and, and by the way, meme plexes are not only national and cultural, but they are also people who listen to heavy metal, people who are fans of a specific football club, people who like the color green. These are all in one way or another meme plexes, right? The, the meme plex is the scale at which this designing is taking place. Then finally, when they all stack up together, they create the new sphere. The new sphere, is what happens when you take the scale at the level of the planet, of humanity as a whole. And they say that the climate is changing, and indeed it is, but it's not only the physical climate, but uh, the mental climate is also becoming more volatile. 
at the noosphere, what we're seeing right now because of technology is that meme plexes are flowing in and out of each other more and more, faster and faster, more volatile. Information is flowing. And so changes at the order of the noosphere are climatological. They are geological. They are at the total scale of humanity. They speak to the progress of the total man since the beginning of history. And so these are the five scales of the memetic stack, which is this, this concept that, that I employ, this device, this apparatus that I employ in my book to try to map in terms of their size and application, the practice effects of our ontological designs and of the things we propose as ontological designs. Great, man. I love thinking about it. I love the way you bring in that like metaphor of the weather as well. Like it has particular patterns. And at the moment we're in a, a stormy time, you could say. It's like the, the reality tunnels that people would have existed in for a long time prior to the internet would have been conditioned by a meme plex that is something like a geographical entity, I guess. And its ability to communicate itself to proliferate itself through certain information technologies whether they be speech or writing or newspaper or whatever but now as you kind of said we've got these apparatuses of laptops and zoom which means all of a sudden you and i and probably the people who will be listening to this are in a memeplex that is just blasted off it's completely virtual we are in the same boat whether we like it or not we're connected right now information is glaring in from the screens onto your symbolic makeup You'll remember these words tomorrow and three days from now. And this happens with every YouTube video you watch, with every newspaper article that you read. Technology is the, great, the greatest cause of the emergence of the new sphere, uh, this, this concept by Telhard de Chardin. And it just speaks to the fact that acceleration of the human mind is taking place at a scale that we cannot avoid. Um, and this also speaks to the to technology is human, is humanity. We cannot say technology is one thing and humans are another. Technology is a byproduct of the extension of human needs into tools and towards our world. So when we speak of a new sphere that emerges via technology and via the humans that creates, we are talking about an extension of the biosphere, which in turn is an extension of the geosphere and in turn of many previous cosmological events that came up before. So you can't really say that technology isn't natural what I'm trying to say is that it's a natural continuation of, it's a next nature, uh, a continuation of what humans are doing. And as such, when we speak of the climate of the newosphere, we're talking about the human mental climate collectively, accelerating, obviously, via the internet, the great catalyzer. That's why what we're witnessing today in 2022, our generation of the living, is almost like the emergence of a new, of a new planetary force. This is bigger than the invention of fire, and I would argue even bigger than the invention of agriculture. Because here we see the ankle points of all exponential curves. Hmm. So let me like put this to you. So I've got my little media academy that's going for about six, seven months or so. And that is a group of people who meet up regularly using some of these core apparatuses, Zoom and the computer, to share ideas and information. And, it's, and now they're there's a culture that has been formed that is can partly due to the the ideas that me and my collaborators had about what we wanted to do with it in compact in a in combination with the the conversations and the stuff that the guys who are part of it have wanted to do and now it's kind of growing and i sometimes think of this as like a as an ontological design project in a sense it's like a particular way of seeing and way of being both in the kind of like material order of time and space where I go to my computer on Wednesday evenings to do this thing, but also on the, the symbolic order and the desiring order of mm -hmm. how, I, how I'm looking at the world, the, the books I'm reading, the ideas I'm encountering, the conversations I'm having are all being filtered through this little thing that we came up with six, seven months ago. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that like the kind of correct way to be thinking about an ontological design project? Uh, <clears throat> everything is ontological design everything is architecture everything is designing when you interface with the world there's always a level of designing what you're speaking to me seems like yes it is ontological design but it is not significantly or methodologically different from the types of ontological designing that as humans we have been doing throughout history 
It's humans getting together on the basis of shared interests, shared, way, shared ways of desiring, and sort of general natural networking. What I am interested in, and this speaks to the next steps after this book, what I'm interested in is the ability to formulate a deliberate project, a deliberate study that is able to employ techniques of design research, and uh, delve into ontological design not, not, not only as an amateur uh, craft that we stumble upon, but as a deliberate discipline. To compare, there is, you know, humans have forever, imagine in the Stone Age, we were using these, these old utensils, we were crafting spoons out of wood and we were using stones to create these tiny figures but as civilization evolved people started to look into the craft of how to make wooden spoons or how to design small sculptures and that craft itself kind of became more let's say professionalized more skilled more a thing that's deliberate in and of itself people started to look into this as their job the job emerged of the sculptor or of the because obviously roles have specialized with the progress of civilization. And so something analog to that, I would argue, is happening today with ontological design. We are all amateur ontological designers. In the same way that if I drop you in the woods, you would also be a amateur mm, wood carver or tent builder or fire or cook. But the thing is, we can today employing the skills and, and, and crafts and design research tools of, for example, the design industry and the tech design industry, whose decade is now beginning to end, because now we're starting the real 2020s, um, and start to look at that as a, as, a, as a thing in and of itself, deliberately. So what happens when you assemble 10 designers and a team of psychoanalysts and a team of composers and musicians, and when you, and, and so on and so forth, and you gather them together in a room and you tell them, okay, here's a lot of money, here's a population, make it do this and that create make them believe this and that mm. that is now possible there's a character that was missing in this constellation that is essential the ai technologist but i'll leave it at that but daniel is that not unethical to control what populations think well yes <laughs> i don't know how to respond to this yeah Actually, I do. Uh, the ethical thing to do is to actually dive into this and, and, and explore this, to look at the potential unintended consequences of such a craft, because precisely the fact that there are unintended consequences speaks to its truth. The fact that it can do harm means that it's true, means that it exists, means that we can conceive of its dire effects. Uh, and my position is that we need to look at it is ethical to, to explore uh, the potential pitfalls. What is good when design designs good? It becomes a very tricky feedbacking uh, moral landscape. And so in such a chaotic landscape, there's two options. Stay put and someone will design you. Stay put and your brain will be utterly confused by others by hungry government agencies and corporations and grifters of all sorts or um, look at it study it a little bit more if you want to become a professional fantastic uh, have a critical point of view a deliberate perspective on the fact that that which we believe may have been implanted in our brains to start Everybody needs to have a relationship with reality that is perhaps a little bit less rooted, a little bit more fluid, a little bit more flexible. That is my argument. Mm. And I think, as you know, it's sometimes when we get into this territory of like designing the being of others that I start to get a bit uncomfortable. And yet at the same time, I kind of have to reckon with the fact that it's already happening, right? YouTube and Facebook have already totally, totally colonized my attention. Like the amount of time I spend scrolling on Facebook a day is a fucking ridiculous. Same with other sides of the internet, pornography and so on. It just fucking eats you. And so there's like, given that that is the meteorological conditions of the time, 
is like, do we just have to go forward into it? That increasingly seems to be what the what what stuff is saying, and that's kind of why I bring up my my own media academy project. But really, I suppose what the hope is is to kind of develop some kind of uh, memeplex, you might say, some kind of memeplex with apparatuses that exist as some kind of like digital neo polity sure. within which. Um, we own as much of our attention and desire as we are able to while kind of with the caveat that do I really own my attention and my desire? No, but at least I can perhaps have a say in the environment that owns my attention and my desire. That's, that's such a tremendous <clears throat> question. I feel that this is where ontological design can be split into many different realms of application. The personal, perhaps the professional, even the religious or spiritual. And in the book, I do go through these different levels. So starting with your question, um, absolutely. The gesture of going forward and creating and the fact that you're drawing that up from within yourself is the fertile foundational gesture. The more you understand how ontological design gets to be created and you are sort of trialing it as you go, the better you will be able to do it. Uh, one of the things that comes up for me when you say that is that Oftentimes people do speak about, I will create my own memeplex that is going to have like a little wall around it. And it's going to have all these little apparatuses and we will all live, me and my friends, within it in a safe way forever. The tricky part of this is that it's actually a verb. There's no wall. There's walling. There's no apparatus. There's interacting. It's always verbs in the infinitive. And one of the key things about ontological design is that everything is process. It's literally Deleuzean engineering. And what this means is that what the Media Academy represents, what other memeplexes represent, are more modes of desiring rather than artifacts that are static. That's number one. They're sort of the cadence with which a group of people in a specific moment in time that is limited will desire together and flock together to exchange some value. And then we will go on to another thing and one day we'll die. Now, the professional portion of ontological design is, is different in nature in that it can have a brief originated by corporations and oriented by power and the profit motive. And there it will be able to be perhaps more deliberate it will investigate the potential means that it's going to use uh, with a deeper, radically deeper effect. Uh, and, and, and because the difference between these two modes, the professional and the creative one, is still so incredibly large, that's why I'm inclined to go and study the professional one first, since given the fact that it will have expectedly so much money poured into it in the next 10 years, there's a lot of learning to happen in there. But once that learning is done, then we can start to employ it on other bits of culture. It's the difference. It's, it's the analog situation to what existed with web design in 1994 versus in 2014. In 1994, nobody knew what was uh, the internet or web design. or What does this mean? How does this buying, selling online? Interesting. Well, what can happen here? 20 years later or 25 years later, we are where we are and everybody knows that you know the biggest corporations in the world are tech companies there are whole new bodies of knowledge emerging around technology and the internet and so this is where we are with ontological design uh we are still in the art in the beginning of the time period of the era where we will see ontology itself perception being and belief as a creative subject matter the third layer there's a creative personal one, the professional and the religious one. The third one is the mad one, right? It's the one where you can foresee certain creative characters emerging that will invent things that will likely be at the origin of empires or be at the origin of new religions, millennialism, right? Synthias, what, what is going to emerge in this era where for the first time we're able to technologize phenomenology Jesus is a God of civilization and of agriculture, of settled society. Even his metaphors are about grapes and wheat. What is that, if not a technological invention? So what will the new gods speak of? 
Maybe not wheat and wine, but maybe their body will be made of data and AI and information itself and belief itself and phenomenology itself. So that's the, the level at which ontological design can really go radical, risk psychosis, risk schizophrenia, because precisely we are dealing with the absolute edges of what we constitute as social reality itself. Mm. And this is where I do think the kind of horizons of some of the the projects like the Media Academy I've mentioned are kind of like tending towards like actually trying to kind of experiment with creative desiring and expression while studying the history of forms of religion and culture, but not being um, tied to any of them other than in a sense of kind of like playfulness. Like there's something that um, my, like the, the Vajrayana guy is continuing empathy, right? It's like the emptiness of all of these forms. And so they're there to be, they're like, uh, I often like the metaphor of a music genre. So as a guitarist, I am proficient, I guess I could say in a couple of genres, perhaps an initiate into one or two of them, but I can pick and choose from the different bits of, genre and i'm only really there limited by my own skill and my own ability to bring them together and so it is there's a kind of element of design there i think there's a, okay what does the, yeah what, what what is my what is my desire saying in this moment what skills do i have available but skill is not limited to technique Bro. skill is also a meme plex what meme plexes do i have skill in what meme plexes do i have a literacy in Bro, let's divide, let's divide and conquer. So you study perception framed religious thing. And I'll, I'll study perception framed technologically. They're not too different. They're not two poles. They overlap. They're diffuse things. We need to, for all of you listening, let's all for once and for all forget the habit of having these neat little structures. Let's think of things diffusely as processes because that's where the fun lies. But you are fundamentally right on that ontological design does point towards a religious tech innovation an innovation in the perception of belief it's a religious technology rather it's a religious technique not a technology uh it's not and as such because the common denominator of these new religious techniques that i discuss and older religions is man and because man is the common denominator, there will be overlap between studying ancient Buddhism and varying traditions, East, West, North, South. There's an overlap between that and the study that today is beginning to be studied uh, in the fields of, of consumer research, design research, in the fields of data analytics where for the first time we have access to an incredible amount of data, which allows us an incredible amount of self-awareness. We are no longer limited to the, li to, to the little bit of self-awareness that our phenomenologies and our mighty Lord biology and the Lord himself have given to us. We are no longer limited to that. It's not only our brains now, it's also our brains plus technology. That's new self-awareness. I can talk to you, you're in London, I'm in Copenhagen. I know this is a basic example, but let's say you had the ability to look at your own life in the last week across a million data points that have been pre-digested by someone and offered back to you as insight, as knowledge. What new religions might emerge from that, from that incre incredibly deep knowledge over the 24 hours of your day, over the habits that you engage in? over the ways that you have desired, over the things that had triggered those desires and over the symbolical, grammatical, creative constellation of those things. A great new knowledge will emerge. So that's why I would say one of the next steps for ontological design, or rather one of the first important steps of every ontological design project and enterprise is the question, what are the parameters? What are the parameters that I'm going to define to analyze this human? What will I consider important to select for and not? And what can I create from that? Because this selection is still a very human thing. Uh, and, and I feel like the, that's 
there's going to be great power in there. Uh, in other words, I feel that's the next step for design itself. It's the ability mm. for him to select those parameters. Nice. I like this direction that we're going here, but before we go too crazy, I just want to like draw back a little bit and say, so you said that where we're at at the moment is a bit like 1994 relative to 2014 in terms of web design. But is there anything, any organizations or projects that you've kind of got an eye on that you think seems like a proto-ontological design? Yeah, completely. Um, I, I work with conversation design, meaning my day-to-day -day consists of writing down the scripts for apps that will go into Alexa, into Siri. When you design a conversation, you design a symbolical order a mode of interface. The oldest interface in the world is conversation itself. It's words, it's language. What I'm designing is specific ways through which humans can actually engage in that exchange. Maybe it's for buying tickets. Maybe it's for asking what the weather is. Maybe it's actually mental health chatbots. What I notice in my day-to-day -day work is that we're moving from weak AI to strong AI. We're moving from AI that just fulfills requests. Okay, do this for me. What's the weather? The weather is this, thanks. Two AIs that are negotiating. I'm feeling very bad today. Oh, really? Why are you feeling bad? Well, this and this happened. Well, we all have bad days. Do you want to tell me more about that? There are mental health chatbots today that are able to have these more negotiative conversations, the ones in which you negotiate truth. And this is incredible. So I am indeed noticing, in, and this is my specific day job area, there are many others, but I am noticing in my day job how technology is, again, influencing humans. There are studies around how many kids are losing the need for um, the words please and thank you because they've been habituated to speak with Alexa so much, and Alexa doesn't, want, doesn't need them to say please or thank you. Uh, so kids are growing up without that that level of awareness. So do we want to teach kids to be polite to robots? What new ways of interaction will emerge between the person and apparatuses? What about a, a constellation of design where it's not only your Alexa that can speak to you, but in the 10th or 15th generation, it's your screens and your table and everything else. What about when, some, when someone comes into the playing field and starts solving this design equation, not for say, the old capitalist paradigm of providing a service, solving a problem. <laughs> but what happens when someone comes into this challenge, into this field of battle and starts to say, well, maybe we don't want to just solve problems. Maybe we want to frame how people design and uh, conceive of problems to begin with. Maybe we want to just brainwash them. Could we do it? Well, the answer is yes, because that moment is coming. And that's why I say that, you know, working in AI and having an eye in the industry and, 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 and this overlaps with so many other areas like the metaverse and, and not that I am a big fan of the metaverse, but, but indeed it, there are some clues there as well that yes, technology is moving into a direction where it will become ontological. It, there's no way around it. Capitalism will give its way to attentionalism and attentionalism will seek to design attention. And it's a matter of say five, 10, 15 years before this becomes the new 2008 or 2004, before the new Facebook 3.0 emerges. You know what I mean? Before someone new comes into this playing field, finds a new innovation as the first mover and extracts incredible strategic advantage from such a move. Mm. So favorite. it's like a question of population management almost like new art of governance. It, the toolkit for governors in the 20th century, especially if we expand governance from just politicians to say the kind of <laughs> what I guess Curtis Yovin calls the, the cathedral, right? The yeah, those the folks are um, they'll, they'll arrive 30 years later. Journalists. They'll what? They will be late to this party and they will adapt to the playing field because they no, no, but what I mean is that that function is evolving rather than absolutely those themselves. But what I'm saying is that it's journalists and politicians and other media folk who controlled the levers of of, a, of population desire Completely. in previous centuries 
And now, I mean, it's already very much in place that the big tech companies are designing desire, filtering out certain people or certain laptops that are deemed inappropriate for public consumption, filtering out search results and so on. Absolutely. Governance itself, which uh, I know it's cliche, but it not only shares the etymological roots with cybernetics, but today it shares a functional connection with cybernetics itself proper. So the art of governance of maintaining a polity will soon enough become indistinguishable from architecting ways of collective desiring of, in, of prohibiting some things and allowing for others. If I go to the street right now, and this is Denmark, so it's, it's stupidly clean and, and, and ordered, uh, impressively so, but you know, if you go outside and you decide to break that window, uh, that's not legal. You can't make threats to people. These are prohibitions. Um, and they're part of how my desire is curbed for the collective governance to occur in a more, uh, in a better way. You don't piss in the streets. Uh, what's going to happen in the future is just simply a more sophisticated way of fulfilling this function. Let's prohibit some things and enable others. The thing is, the things you prohibit and the things you enable, two levels. One, you can manipulate them with much more dexterity, much more granularly, with incredibly more power. Number one. Number two, there are many more things that you can now tap into because we desire now exponentially more things than we desired 100 years ago. And God knows how many new ghosts have populated our psyche compared to our ancestors 10,000 years ago. So this is the, this is the ankle point we're at. So what's next for Daniel Fraga? Writing, building, what is it? For a little bit, I will be uh, taking the book and taking its ideas out there and talking to people of different domains. Um, but part of me is already preparing mentally for a next book. And I know that it's perhaps too early to speak about that, but if this book, the ontological design subject as project is very much around the philosophical theoretical tenets of this potential new craft, not potential, I think uh, uh, expectable new craft, then my next book, which is which I've already like laid out and, and structure is going to be about the how-to, a very tangible how-to do ontological design. Step one, step two, step three. If there's a client, if there's a will, if there's a brief, if there's a budget, if there's an intention, how do you take that intention through a series of steps, one, two, three, four, and five, design steps, and bring them to fruition as an ontological design project that is designing subjectivity or subjectivities or subjects for, for, for one guy, for 10 guys, or for a billion guys. This is doable. This is concretely achievable. This is, I can already tell you that this is something that can be done using design research methods by basically updating ever so slightly the design thinking methods supported by companies like IDEO, like Fjord, like Agents Mars, like the typical companies that will consult with your Googles, with your Facebooks of this world, uh, with your governments, with your schooling systems. Basically, design thinking, UX design. And I feel like the next iteration of UX design, the next iteration of service design, of conversation design, is going to have ontological design aspects to it. What does this mean concretely? Just as an example. Well, maybe if you're doing user interviews, um, you're gonna have a psychoanalyst sitting next to you. Designers will know what a user interview is. Uh, if you are doing a customer shadowing exercise, uh, for those of you who are not designers, a shadowing is basically when you look at someone using your app and you take notes to see how they use it. Sometimes you may even give them a prompt. Why don't you try to use my app to log in or change the settings or buy a ticket? Well, shadowing is you just look at the person trying to do it. In the future, 
Well, instead of shadowing how a person uses an app, maybe you can shadow how a person uses their living room or their library or their whole house. Maybe you Truman show the heck out of this and you try to look at the person in their total environment. Maybe now we have AI that can listen to our words. Maybe you can ask AI, hey AI, whenever this human uses the word fuck, let me know. God, because why? Because you can then track this and you can ask yourself questions, hmm, Fuck as an expletive word has this psychological function. You can ask subject matter experts from the era of psychoanalysis. They can uh, help you manage this. And then you can draw insights from there. Well, they use fuck this in that time. Maybe, what does that mean? Well, literally, I don't know what that means, but I know that asking what does that mean will lead you somewhere. And just like these two examples that I've given you, there's plenty more, plenty more. Literally, like, if you want to go into the details, we can. It's terrifying, man. It sounds like a golden age of totalitarians. A trillion totalitarians. Uh, one, <laughs> eight, or, eight or nine for every human being alive today. That's going to be the future. And this will be defended as human rights. Well, I can see it. I can start to visualize it along the axis of something like um, environmental behavior management. And, yeah. People's consumption patterns are damaging the environment. We're all going to die unless we fix this in 20, 30 years. Okay. Let's nudge. I mean, nudging is already popular, right? There was that book, that popular pop psychology book, Nudge about putting vegetables at eye level and so on and so forth to get people to eat more healthily. Why don't we just nudge people's behaviors towards the behavior patterns we see in My the more environmentally goes. conscious parts of the world? I get it. I get it. What I think though, is that if we are at the point where we are, when we are debating, oh, is it desirable that we use these techniques for the global climate change policy issue? If, you, if we're asking that question, we're way, like, we've been lapped by the leading pole position car. We're late, we're done, it's over. Like the question is not whether or not we should or should not use this for good or for evil. Like so many uh, characters we know like to posture around this is not a moral question this is not a moral a question of uh, is it desirable or not this is already happening we know but more importantly than this it will happen for politically realist purposes there will be people who benefit from climate change and they will try to accelerate it the russians for example northern europeans won't suffer so much from it there will be people who will benefit from uh pain inflicted on others because that will increase their own power and benefit the last 75 years of Pax Americana have given us a many fantastic things. I am the most Western person there is, but they've given us a bad habit, which is the habit of mentally being very averse to conceiving conflict, very averse to even imagining what a political realism is. Realpolitik is a, is a thing that we need to, all, to, to be a little bit aware of right now. And what that means, I think, is to be able to conceive of ways that the new competitive landscape is going to look like in the next years. Because now there's a tremendous new weapon. So in the same way that in 1945, geopolitics changed because of the nuclear uh, weapon, today will change again because there's a new atomic weapon. And the atom is called man today and their perception. Look at me calling man there. So look. <laughs> But that's where we're at, man. It will be used for the environmental bit if there is a country with sufficient geopolitical, realpolitik motives to use it. But at the point where the discourse falls into this level, this explicit level, well, we need to do these things to save climate change, then rule of thumb, you're already at, already at the tail end of some plan that was conceived by a Henry Kissinger type guy or Machiavelli type guy. You're hearing the outward facing version of the communications. You're not hearing the initial research and strategy thinking of it. As such, let us 
for those of us who are trying to be a little bit more, I, I, I guess, aware and, and research the root causes of things, let's be a little bit more cynical when we hear these upward facing messages of good, of equality, of justice. These are all things that are used to manipulate the good instincts of good people. Sadly, but truthfully. Mm. And this is also connected to, to kind of the cause of, of what brought me to write ontological design in many ways. I'm tired of hearing this tail end communication that is so low quality. When I hear what press secretaries and presidents and corporations say on their public facing newsletters and on these videos, a part of me revolts against such disrespect. And so I try to one up them because I feel that their intentions are very disrespectful. They are very, just eat this up. This is, this is what, this is how it's going to be from now on tolerated. Here's a moral code for you to live by. Well, you know what? Maybe that moral code is not good enough for me. So I'm going to make something else. I'm going to invent a discipline that is able to design different moral codes. And all of a sudden you have a challenge and we all have challenges. And so that's, that is the wild card here. So that's where the kind of, as much as there's the, the terrifying totalitarian implications, there's also the kind of, um, to put it simply, freedom fighter element of it as well in saying like, you and I are already at the intersection of God knows how many powerful agencies, 10, 15, 25, 50, 100 year plans. Absolutely. And listen, if we die in mysterious circumstances, please please be aware that I will not commit suicide, that I do not intend to commit suicide. And if that happens, ask questions. No, jokes. Uh, <laughs> but we certainly are, at least in a route. It's not, it's maybe we're not that far ahead and there's other people researching this stuff that are way far further ahead than us. But point being, we're at an intersection where the fact that you have a lot of money, a lot of technology is not really going to assure your advantage. The essential thing is having talent and skill to design or navigate a changing era. We're in a changing era. The rules of warfare and competition are changing. Naturally, there are many players involved in this landscape who have an interest in succeeding because everybody wants to succeed because competition is, is very much at the root of things. Um, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the things that it's, is at the root of, of how human societies develop. As such, there is a great interest in developing new weapons. And I think that that is precisely where ontological sits, ontological design sits at the intersection of war, weapon design, psychological operations, but also at the intersection of design, at the intersection of uh, technology innovation, and at the intersection of art and religion, which is something that you know better than anybody else that I know. The ability to, 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 to modulate belief and perception artistically. You can't throw money at a problem and expect a quality solution, the likes of which you could conceive of. Oh, so that is my point. The bottleneck here is human skill. And that is why, as always, as humans, we are in an arms race. Adapt or, or, or die. Plata or plomo. This is not new. Those ancestors of ours who had a distaste for agriculture, where guess what? They are not our ancestors. Simple as that. How far through the eye of the needle we already are. It's like I kind of sometimes still wake up and think, oh, I'm still living in 2015 and I just do a bit of stuff on the internet. It's like, no. <laughs> we're living in something else, I think. And we're thinking about something else. And the, I don't know, like Carl Smith, one of our friends made a Facebook post the other day that was like 10 years ago, virtual reality was an escape from reality, whatever is outside that window. Whereas now it's the other way around. 
It's like getting out into the street without a device is rare. And these devices are still rather stupid. They, their designers and their creators haven't really thought of how to make their apps and devices truly speak in an adaptive negotiating fashion with our innermost impulses. They're still at level one of attentional gathering. Oh, it's like teaching pigeons how to read. They're still at that level. Reward punishment and maximize attentional time extraction, eyeball time. That's what they're at right now. Once they discover that they can also modulate not only with ones and zeros, but with a whole variety of parameters, a little bit like traditional computing and quantum computing. In other words, when they realize that it's possible to take and investigate carefully, smartly, methodologically, scalably, such symbolic discursive parameters in humans, like you and me, the words that we use, the like, the things we like, the things that flare up our hearts and libidos. And when the app designers and whatever else they come up with that are, that are not apps, discover this level two, this deeper level of the iceberg, this more unconscious psychoanalytic design, then we will enter an era that is going to be 10 times more impactful and deeper and changing than the era of the internet has been. And we all know that the era of the internet has changed our world. So the next era is going to change our world 10 times more. And that's the importance of ontological design is to navigate such changes under because it's, 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 come, it's becoming closer and closer to chaos. And yes, there are anchors, there are limits, supply chains, the body, hunger, geopolitics. We're in Ukraine has kind of showed us that we are not uh, past the point of war. We will never be sexuality. These are sort of the, the anchors of such changes and the human is the only thing that will not accelerate in this level and the human essentialities are things that will keep us grounded but uh, they will be put through the blender they will be put through the blender and it's going to be mad what comes up afterwards it's going to be cyborg not even transhumanism but a new post-humanism the answer to that, oh, is it posit positive? Is it negative? Yo, design it or be designed. There's no good and evil anymore. It's going to be so utterly mad that the frames through which we see reality from the past are at best half relevant. We, For example, we will need to review so much of philosophy and, and, and thought from a new lens, from the lens of ontological design or from the lens of, of technologically augmented perception. It's like the past will always will continually be revalued by this increasingly accelerating change of lens of the present, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course it does. Something that occurs to me is if you're kind of you're expecting the design of the future is at this intersection, say, between people with the traditional design and architecture skills and the technologists and those with what you might call deep knowledge of human subjectivity, psychoanalysts and so forth. Yeah. <clears throat> As someone with a degree of, I suppose, I don't know if it's expertise, but certainly a degree of skill in some of these modalities, it makes me think there's a degree of kind of personal ethical responsibility to not sell it to anyone who just walks past. Now, maybe that's just a slightly kind of futile gesture on my behalf, and maybe evil Frogger is sitting there like, I'll sell out to anybody, baby. But I, I kind of hope that I and the the people, to, I guess, a degree to which I have some kind of influence over We'll think carefully about selling forbidden knowledge to people with technological power just for a buck, rather than doing it 
with some kind of I don't want to say utopian because you're going to laugh at me, but some kind of um, at least self-interest in it. Beautiful well, self-interest. There is as much self-interest present in the attitude of the seller as there is in the attitude of the one who refuses to sell. And I would argue that obviously there's a choice to be made. It's not going to be first come, first serves. There's always tactical conditionings, but... What if the ethical person here is the seller? Well, I'm sure sometimes the ethical person is the seller and sometimes not. And that's the point I'm getting at, I guess. Is that if... It's going to be situational. Yeah, it will be situational. And there's no absolute rule. Like I can't conceive of me coming up with a like, right, under these circumstances, it is morally acceptable for everybody who has a degree of, say, psychoanalytical knowledge to sell it to this corporation. Of course, that's bullshit. Absolutely. And yet the, the schools of thought and uh, practice that are emerging, I guess, will, perhaps now I'm shifting into a descriptive mode, will have their own, you could even say, design principles, um, norms, codes, and so forth into who they interface with and who they share with and so on. And actually tracking how that... Um, how that plays out will be will be interesting and also something to have skill for. I mean, like I know that um, Bard has used the metaphor of like us going towards a Silk Road again with monasteries along the way. Completely. And and this is the thing. It's like I guess I kind of see myself as being part of the kind of like monastery crowd. People are going to be coming to us and saying, "Sell me something. I want to know hear- how reality works." And it's like, okay. Do you hear Show a great lens? I discovered the other day a lens that, though simplistic, kind of illustrates the same principle of the landscape we're in. It illustrates the, it tells a story about the landscape. In the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s in medieval Europe, there were there was a lot of war and there were a lot of castles and a lot of them had high walls. There was no gunpowder yet. And so there was a trebuchet, which was a really important weapon, which is a contrivance made of wood that is able to throw stones at a long distance, like artillery, primitive. Um, So it's a machine made of wood and gravity, but it's actually a rather intelligent machine. So the, the skill to do it was rare. And there were these characters who were the trebuchet engineers who traveled around Europe like itinerant mercenaries teaching specific armies on specific battles. Hey, what's up guys? Here's how you build a trebuchet. And they would build trebuchets, fantastic, well-paid, well-rewarded, friends with the king, fucked his daughter, and was able to go to the next country. And so that's the landscape we're on right now. Trebuchets, or rather contrivances of great competitive power, such as the ones that I estimate can be done through ontological design, with enough proper people and with enough budget and with enough hard work and talent. These contrivances are today's trebuchets. And we are in a situation where the skill to build those trebuchets for the next 10, 15, 20 years, still kind of rare, just in the same way that we see today that like, yeah, today everybody goes into tech, but like 20 years ago, not so many people went into it. And in many ways, it's not that they were smarter. No, it was simply, the fact that tech was where it was at. And today where it is at, and I will tell you what it is in a little bit, is it's a partial object. It's that human phenomenology. Because somewhere around here, there was, there was a lock that was been opened because AI came in. And that's where it is at, this partial object that I'm referring to the techno-capitalist Angregor that leads history, of which we are part and parcel and in an intimate relationship with. I like it, man. I could I could leave it there, you know. That sounds good. That sounds good. What else comes up? 
any conclusion anything last that does still makes you feel as we move Maybe. like i said terrified but excited and i think at the end there was some clarity forming like i said around at least thinking through as trebuchet designers who gets a trebuchet and of course like i said probably the irony is that already everybody who wants a trebuchet has got a trebuchet or will be getting one what trebuchet would you build what trebuchet would i build if you could build any trebuchet you'd like See, I, I, I honestly think this age is the era of ghosts and they will assail us because they will post to us such an impossible question. A question which derives precisely from a technology of ghosts. Mm. Feedback loop, alas, complete. I want multimedia labs, man. I just want fucking to, to play my electric violin on top of a mountain or hurtling through a fucking vortex of fire. What does the technology of the violin do to your imagination? That is a very interesting question. It speeds up my pace of thought and expression. It enhances melodrama. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the example of a good user interview. Or rather, this one last question. Because from what I heard from you right now, I, I want to say, as a technology, it's a tremendously advanced technology. And, and so far, we haven't replaced it yet. Because it's not any mu music on the violin that does that. But the violin itself, as an apparatus, is able to modulate your perception at parameters such as, you said intensity, emotional quality. You said, you said what? That was some synesthetic yeah melodrama uh, pace of expression intensity of expression it's a modulator it's a transistor mm. what what does an architecture of transistors look like because i think you you also pointed out yeah so maybe i was a little bit too mercenary when i was answering your previous question but what you've pointed out right now is the possibility of the great new work of art which is the religious part well that's where i'm at yeah I do politics and social fucking stuff. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'm just building a ladder. But, man, art and religion is where it's at, man. I know, I know. I'm just building ladders. Mm -hmm. But I do, of course, where, where else would it come from? It's pure Machiavellian self-interest? Of course not. This is... This is um... The idea of the this we are such enlightenment people. Uh, the idea of the all-seeing eye of the providence eye of providence. The idea that you know, the great unconscious will provide that there is some wisdom and processes and materials and the shape of existence itself. I'm not here to gnosticize and say it looks like A, B, or C. No, but rather in the process there is a truth which we are. So we're if it doesn't matter we're not separate from spirit we are spirit itself and as an interested part it is in our benefits to believe in it as if it existed objectia you don't ever achieve it but believing is force mm. that's why you pray that's why praying is smart because you're talking to something as if it was there and you give yourself fully to that to that to that knowledge and to be honest you don't know if it's not there keep the question mark well in a sense it is there right it's not existence maybe because everywhere it, it, it is not but it is the relationship that gets established well i think it's, it's like our relationship with our own non-being it's some good advice i heard from one of our friends was the way to pray is always to ask to serve rather than to ask for stuff it's it's like please destroy me more oh yeah oh yeah there's a there's islam means submission 
Yes, but it's that is interesting. It's not like blind submission to something, but it's more like show me the way. Let it's me get out of my own way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is like, there, like there's, that's even why, like I think, the same methodology, design methodology, you could say, exists in twelve step groups. The first thing is to admit that you're fucked on your own and you need help from some kind of higher thing. I would say the twelve step groups make it extremely simple and very eighteenth century. Of course they do, that's but the it is a it's an interesting case study because it is a methodology with results. Absolutely. And, 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 and results are not, I mean, that's a utilitarian thing. I agree. Even to say that results are the evidence of existence is, is, is a modern take, but to, 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 to cast non-being at the right place at our ontological table, it's the right move. You cast non-being as God. This is what one does. And the thing is, it actually is. It's just the hidden one. But the way it speaks, it speaks in this way, precisely like you define. You hear it. You, you, you don't talk to it like you talk to people or stuff or to, you know, there's a, there's a special type of talking there. I think that's it. You hear it, you serve it, and you make offerings to it. Give advice. You don't even say sentences. Like the utterance is of a different sort. I would say that it is much more. The muscles of emotion have a specific shape or are exerted in a specific way, which is usually a non articulation. It's like getting out of your own way, like you say. Forgetting, like if I forget it, let me just the forgetfulness itself operatively inscribed. In any case, can't you see? But can't you see, Owen? The the great issue here is the discussion of such religious things. That's why it's so hard to go into the religion. I'm not going to write a book on that. What am I going to do? Create a new method for how to be it? No. Um, For what religious apparatus should make sense? No. But here's a lot. Well, I think method is the, it's like, again, let's take an analogy. Let's take learning to play the guitar. Every teacher has a certain method that they teach. This is how to think about harmony. This is how to practice. This is how to move your fingers. But ultimately, everyone's got a different method and the method is not the point. Absolutely. And really to write a, a description of guitar playing one does not need to know the method if anything i think where you're at is more like saying come over here and do this you're trying to set a fire so people walk towards it and then people will do it and they'll write their methods they'll write their 12 steps and how to build a cult and sell it on amazon for three pound 99 on kindle i'm saying there's many special ways to buy studios build studios select instruments get a bottle of wine in the space get people together uh i'm not going to tell them how to write their song maybe you can do that a little bit like set some rules on how which strings they can use what tunings they can create uh but otherwise it's it's people who do this because that's exactly the other facet of the other that we do not know there is the father but there is also the sun, which is the other, which is not there. This impossibility of not knowing, again, this other face of God. Christian as ever, man. <clears throat> Christian as ever. Can wrap up? Yeah, man, let's wrap up. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, I was on Cox, the pan singing his own hymn. <laughs>